Good afternoon. I'm Sayu Bojwani. I'm a visiting scholar here at Eagleton. I see some familiar faces from a talk that I gave in uh, October. Um, but now I'm in a different kind of hot seat with, uh, with someone else who's going to be uh, doing, sharing most of, uh, who's going to be the person mostly sharing his expertise with you. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Frank Sherry, who uh, has been an advocate on immigration reform for uh, really since I've been doing this work. And I've encountered him in a number of his different roles, including <laughs> as the executive director of the National Immigration Forum. Today he's here in his role as founder and executive director of America's Voice, which is an advocacy group based in Washington, D.C. that has been working on the front lines of national immigration reform. We will have a conversation. Uh, it, and actually, he will be answering questions mostly, so it will be less of a conversation. And then we'll open it up to a conversation with those of you who are in the audience who I know have very specific areas of interest around immigration reform. Uh, the first part of my conversation with him is to help set the stage for how we've gotten to this point, some of the efforts that uh, have been, that the immigrant reform, immigration reform movement has been engaged in and what his sort of insights are about what might happen uh, after today um, and in this current Congress and into the future. So um, we'll speak for maybe 30 minutes or so and then open it up for questions. So I'm going to just begin uh, by asking you, Frank, if you could first um, tell us, given your background in history, a little bit about how the debate today feels similar to and different from the early 1980s when we got to the Immigration Reform and Control Act, um, which commonly is known as IRCA, and actually affected a much smaller number of people than we're talking about today. It was 2.7 million who actually took advantage of that, uh, that act. So if you could talk a little bit about how things look si similar and different to 20 years ago. Sure. Um, that's a lot of history to... <laughs> describe succinctly. Highlights. Yeah, so um, IRCA, or the Immigration Reform and Control Act that passed in 86, came about as a result of a commission that Jimmy Carter, when president, appointed. It was called the Hesburgh Commission after Ted Hesburgh of Notre Dame. And it basically came up with this idea of matching employer sanctions to try to prevent illegal hiring with the legalization and citizenship, and a path to citizenship, a citizenship option for rooted, undocumented immigrants. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether that worked or failed, and it, it, it definitely pervades the current discussion. But that was very much an expression of kind of the top-down, commission-oriented uh, legislation. In the 90s, you had a period of individual bills, depending on the mood, some positive or pro-immigrant from my point of view, some uh, less generous or harsher towards immigrants. And then after 9-11, the debate really became much more heated. And you've seen the rise of bottom-up movements on both sides of the debate. Uh, those who are opposed to liberalized immigration or to legalizing undocumented immigrants, and those who are in favor of it. And that's the battle that you're seeing play out now. Um, uh, the 2012 election was very much uh, something of a referendum for us on the issue in that Mitt Romney embraced the positions that our opponents hold. Our opponents call it attrition through enforcement. Mitt Romney called it self-deportation. The idea is that you pass state, local, and federal laws that make life so difficult for the 11 million undocumented immigrants that the, the, the theory is, is that they'll pick up and leave. This was being tried in Arizona and Alabama in particular. Um, uh, and it was driving some people into other states. It wasn't driving people out of the country for the most part. But it was a, it was a strategy that was being fully uh, implemented because they were successfully blocking reform at the federal level and making progress from their point of view on the state level. The election, of course, where Barack Obama uh, uh, leaned into the issue for the first time in mid-2012 he, he used his executive authority to protect dreamers, young people who are undocumented, called dreamers for the DREAM Act, which was blocked in 2010 by uh, Republicans in Congress. And um, he, by executive authority, was able to stop the deportation of dreamers. It led to a spike in enthusiasm of Latino voters for Barack Obama. Uh, 
uh, running in, in the run up to 2012. He had tremendous success with Asian American voters, mm -hmm. a story that's been less covered. I'm sure, Sayu, you're familiar with it, though. It's really one of the most remarkable turnabouts in American politics. The fastest growing group, uh, group of voters in America is not Latino, it's Asian Pacific American. And in fact, uh, they have switched from being two to one in favor of George Herbert Walker Bush to being more than two to one in favor of Barack Obama, a remarkable turnabout mm -hmm. in American politics. Nevertheless, that's what created the opening for the debate we're having now. It led to the Senate passing legislation um, on a bipartisan basis back in June. But of course, we're, we're now dealing with a divided and a reluctant House of Representatives. Uh, some journalists like to predict that we're dead. Some say <laughs> that uh, we're going to have a couple of windows of opportunity. We take an optimistic view. But we're now in the throes of mobilized movements who uh, try to have voters. We don't have a lot of, there's two forms of currency in American politics, money and votes. We don't have a lot of money in the immigration. You know, we're not like, you know, we're not doing a lot of campaign contributions. But what we are able to do is to mobilize voters. And so uh, the, the contest now between those who can mobilize immigrant voters and allies of immigrant voters versus those who rally on a more with a, from a more restriction, restrictionist point of view, that's what's playing out. I, for one, will just say that I'm confident that whether we get immigration reform, broad immigration reform through Congress this year or not, and I'm desperately hopeful that we do, um, I, am, I am pretty optimistic that this, the 2012 election and the debate this year serves as a turning point, a pretty dramatic turning point from just a few months and years back when it looked like the restrictionist forces had the upper hand. I think now the pro-reform forces have the upper hand and it's a matter of when, not if, that we, mm -hmm. we get it across the finish line. So that was a long answer to a short yeah. question, wasn't it? That's Sorry okay. That, that took care of some of the other questions. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the specific work of America's Voice, which I know emerged after um, things didn't go so well on uh, immigration reform in 06 and 07. Um, could you talk a little bit about the strategy that informed the emergence of your organization and also what some of the key lessons were learned in 06 and 07 and how that's informing the work you're doing now? Yeah. So many of us came up with this idea of putting together different components together in a package that would constitute a modernization of our immigration system. Did this really back in the late 1990s. The idea of if you have border security with employment verification to try to prevent illegal hiring, combined with improvements to our legal immigration system, combined with a legalization and path to citizenship option, that those four elements combined would lead to a, 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 a set of policies that we could accurately describe as reflecting our traditions as both a na nation of immigrants and a nation of laws. That a liberalized, uh, legalized, uh, legal, and orderly system, for the most part, will never eliminate illegal immigration entirely, but we can, uh, in, right now, about a third of the immigrants in America are here without status. That is clearly a major mm -hmm. symptom of how broken the status quo is. Anyway, 06, 07, we tried very hard to pass uh, legislation. We were riding uh, Ted Kennedy, uh, John McCain, and George W. Bush. They were fighting hard for reform in 06, 07. We suffered a, a, a huge defeat in 2007, and then we reoriented. Uh, and we decided that if we were gonna come back, we needed to do a better job of mobilizing allies, and of course, working more directly with immigrants as this the subjects of the debate rather than objects of the debate. And that's what's happened. You see the emergence of dreamers. You see the uh, kind of bottom-up organizing in faith communities, in the labor movement, in community groups. Um, thousands of events in the last year all over the country. Just a tremendous bottom-up organizing. And that was different than the kind of top-down approach that we were relying to before. As part of that effort, we realized that, quite frankly, uh, uh, we modeled ourselves after an electoral campaign, but you know, an issue advocacy effort is ongoing. There's no mm -hmm. election day. Um, you just go until you hopefully win. And we wanted to strengthen our voter mobilization efforts and field organizing efforts. We wanted to uh, sustain our policy and research component. But what we uh, also needed was a stronger communications hub. 
And that's what America's Voice was founded to be, the communications hub of the immigration reform movement. So we spend a lot more time trying to drive our messages and our narrative than we do trying to lobby members of Congress per se. Mm -hmm. So talk about two or three, would you say, are the sort of top headlines of, of your work in terms of the, the messaging and the findings. Um, a lot of what you do is polling and research. Um, we know as a result in part of your work that six out of 10 Republicans support some change in the immigration system, that two thirds of Americans believe that the immigration system is broken and needs some fix. Other headlines? Yeah, probably the thing that we are most uh, proud of as an organization is that it was very clear to us that the political conventional wisdom just a few years ago was that immigration was a culturally charged wedge issue that worked for de Republicans and against Democrats like welfare, crime, affirmative action, marriage equality, et cetera. It was in that panoply of, uh, of issues where Republicans would drive a wedge between, Dem Democrats would be wedged between pandering to minorities and appealing to swing voters. And Republicans love to use such wedge issues to um, mobilize conservatives, win over independents, and defied uh, progressives. Uh, we realized early on that that whole conventional wisdom was based not on fact, but on perception. That the fact is, is that immigrants were the fastest growing groups of voters in the, new con in, in the country. That they were going to be increasingly of a, a, a decisive factor in elections at all levels. And that immigration reform was a defining issue, not for all immigrant voters, but for many. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly those who are closer to the immigrant experience, of course. And so what we saw in California, for example, when Pete Wilson picked up the anti-immigrant baton in 1994, before some of you were even born, <laughs> um, it helped him win um, the election and uh, come from behind a uh, race for governor in 1994. Many people thought he was gonna beat Bill Clinton in 1996. That's how powerful this issue was. Um, he wrote a, an anti-immigrant ballot initiative called Prop 187. Um, but what happened is that in California, people like Eliseo Medina, who's one of the people fasting on the mall in front of the Capitol as we speak in his 20th day of fasting to try to urge the House to take up immigration reform, he and others said, look, let's organize immigrants to become citizens, to become voters, and if they vote their interests, uh, it'll change the state. And as a result, California went from a state that reliably elected uh, Republican governors, five out of six governors had been Republican until this shift of mobilizing Latino and Asian voters and has turned California into one of the bluest states in the country. That same project is what's happening uh, nationally and, and we were able to carve out what was happening in a way that the conventional wisdom, uh, Ruth Mandel and I were talking about Chuck Todd recently uh, and Chuck Todd was one of those people that we thought might get it before others. Mm -hmm. And we were sending him polling information and fact sheets and race analyses and things for a long time. And one day he was on a show and we were with he says, you know, I was doing some research last night. <laughs> and he clearly had our fact sheets in front of him. And he says, you know, I think this Latino vote's gonna be a factor in the 2012 election. Anyway, making sure that that broke through uh, was an important part of creating the space for the policy change that we see. Now, I, I'm gonna hasten to add, Republicans have a tremendous opportunity with Asian and Latino voters. I mean, you saw the example of Chris Christie, and I know that's controversial given his flip-flopping on the State Dream Act, which I'm sure we'll get into. But the fact that he could win 51% of the Latino vote at a time when Ken Cuccinelli in my home state of Virginia was cratering with Latino voters. He, made, uh, he, made, he had an unfortunate uh, verbal stumble where he re seemed to compare immigrants to rats, which for some reason didn't go over very well. In any case, um, so, so you have this situation where you know, George W. Bush just, what, 2004? Any mm -hmm. math majors here, what's that? Nine years ago? He won so, as, yeah. many, as much as 44% of the Latino vote. Asian voters went overwhelmingly for George Herbert Walker Bush. So this is a party that's lurched to the right, alienated the fastest growing group of new voters, many of whom, immigrant voters in particular, don't have strong affiliations or parental influences on who they vote for. So there's this huge opportunity, but if you keep telling people we don't like your kind, mm 
it's pretty hard to get them to vote for you. And that's the national GOP's problem. That was the finding of their, uh, their autopsy after the 2012 election. Unfortunately, I don't think the House uh, Republicans to date have gotten the memo. So, whew. well, and let's just go right to the national debate then, shall we, and skip any of the, uh, the I was going to ask you a question about game changers for your work, but maybe we'll come back to that. Um, because the 2012 election, for some people, um, I feel similar to you do, that, that, you know, it's as if all of a sudden the immigrant vote is a surprise to people. Right. They haven't been watching what's been happening in their communities. And, and, you know, there was all this talk about the new American demographic and the new American coalition in 2012. But anybody who had been paying attention to what's been going on at the local level shouldn't have been surprised. And, and I think also that there is no guarantee that any Democratic president, presidential candidate is going to win over the Asian and Latino vote in the way that President Obama did, as just very recent history has shown. Uh, so I, I would agree that there's a huge opportunity. So what is going on um, in D.C.? Why is that opportunity not getting the attention that it should get? I mean, recent in the recent headlines, you just talked about the, the fasting that's been going on. 20 days, um, a number of immigrant advocates have been fasting on the National Mall. At the same time, Boehner is, could we say he's flip-flopping on whether immigration reform is going to happen this year? Uh, and then the president gave a speech uh, last week to Asian American community members in the Bay Area and was heckled on his uh, administration's deportation issue. Uh, and so we're hearing a lot of different things in the media. Some things get more attention than others. Can you give us a little bit of a behind the scenes view of what's going on um, in places where it really matters around the legislation? Oh, that's an ugly place to go. <laughs> um, well, look, I mean, let's start with the good news, is that coming out of the election and, and leading up to the Senate vote, there was this sort of air of inevitability about immigration reform. Bob Menendez, a, senator, a senior senator from uh, New Jersey, played a, a, a very prominent role in the Gang of Eight negotiations, four Democrats, four Republicans. They crafted... Uh, what I think can be accurately described as a centrist, perhaps center-right bill, uh, uh, that was able to attract 68 votes in a polarized Congress, in a polarized Senate. Pretty remarkable accomplishment. But, um, you know, we have a bicameral system in the House of Representatives. I I've learned more about the House of Representatives in the past six months than I care to know. <laughs> Um, here's what I've learned. Uh, John Boehner um, is only the leader of the House in name. Uh, if he says he's for something, there's such a reaction within his caucus that it spells doom for that thing. So mm -hmm. it's widely suspected by both pro and uh, opponents, pro forces and opponent opposition forces, that he really wants reform. He's the kind of business-oriented Republican that wants reform. But if he gets too far out in front of his caucus, the reaction will be too negative. So therefore, you have to wait for other members to kind of self-organize to get a, uh, to meet the requirements of the conservatives who still hold sway in the House, which is you have to go through regular order, uh, have a majority of the majority, this is the infamous Haster rule, um, to, in order to move things. And the, and, and, and the issue's relatively new. I mean, a, a year ago, they, most of them were comfortably saying, well, they should go home if they're here illegally. Screw it. And voting against the DREAM Act as if there wouldn't be any repercussions with Latino voters who watched the House Republicans on live Spanish language television vote against the best and brightest of their community. There were and are, and so they've decided to change their tone, to grapple with new policy, to get organized so that they can get to yes, and they haven't yet. Will they? Most of the, the wise, uh, uh, cynical press corps in DC says, of course not. They, they just threaten the world economy on a shutdown. Of course they're not going to pass something that divides their ranks. They're going to press the Obamacare button until 2014 and just slow walk immigration to death. Others of us think that there is still a couple of windows op of opportunity and that they'll, they will organize themselves, they will come out with proposals that won't be perfect regarding how to deal with undocumented youth. They're struggling with a bill called the Kids Act, not the Dream Act, but it's their version. We haven't seen it yet. And then they're struggling with a proposal for the 11 million that's not a, uh, a, a clear path to citizenship, but some citizenship option 
for most of those who get legalized. But it's really hard for us to, to deal or react to this stuff because it's only newspaper articles. Mm -hmm. And I keep telling reporters, they're saying, well, aren't you guys drawing a hard line? Why don't you negotiate? I was like, I can't, we can't negotiate with a newspaper article. Like a one pager, black and white, happy to deal with that. But you gotta come, you gotta bring it. And so the fact that they haven't shows how difficult it is for them to get a proposal that a half, half their membership would vote for. If they do, then I think we'll have votes on uh, these measures in the spring, and then a chance either in the summer or in the lame duck session to get across the finish line. Um, but most people are predicting not. Um, I, I, I agree that our chances have de definitely gone down since they didn't take floor action before the end of the year. Uh, they ran out the clock saying they were too busy. Are you kidding me? They're the only people in America who work <laughs> half time and get full benefits. Um, but uh, so be it. In any case, they just, they haven't, so people who say immigration reform is dead, I, I say that's a prediction, not a fact. It may turn out to be true. But we really won't. I think we'll know for sure by April or May. That's when, that's when the next window really opens, after the budget discussion, after the, all, all the worry about primary filings happen, mostly by the end of, of, of April. So I think we'll see. And they're going to have to get organized. They're going to have to, get, again, get a majority of votes on some of these issues they find controversial. By the way, the American people don't find them very controversial. The Republican voters don't find them very controversial. It's only controversial because uh, to a large extent, Republicans are very afraid of, some people call it the Tea Party, but let's just say people within their party who think that uh, legalizing immigrants or liberalizing immigration is bad for the country. So can you talk actually about, I mean, I have two, two questions, one of which is immediately following up on what you just said, um, and then one that goes back to, uh, to this kind of protracted timeline and what, what is there to negotiate if there's no actual bill. But, uh, and then you can take whichever one makes sense to you. Uh, so one is about this article that Julia Preston did in the New York Times about 10 days ago, right, saying that there are many uh, members of the immigrant community who would be willing to accept some provisional legal status that is not necessarily uh, a pathway to citizenship. And I think that those of us who, who know people who are undocumented can understand that sentiment, right, that it's better than living in fear. Uh, and better than not being able to entirely live your life um, it, it, given this, the status situation. Um, I'm curious, and I know that this, that this was a challenge in the 06 and 07 debates. Um, I, I'm curious about whether you think that advocates who are working on this issue now are willing to accept anything short of a pathway to citizenship. Um, I, I totally understand if you feel like that's putting something out there that you don't no, want to negotiate right. in public. but. I'm curious about whether this tension is going to play out differently in this round, right? Like there's 11 million people, there's certain categories, there's the dreamers and the ag jobs and the high tech yeah. workers. I mean, sadly, there's a large segment of people in the middle. Those are our restaurant workers and domestic workers and a, and a, a large number of people who have a harder time documenting their long-term residency in the U.S. that would get left out if everything was, if it was piecemeal. So there's sort of the piecemeal question versus the kind of provisional legal status. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, not versus, but the, those two sort of areas. Can you talk a little bit sure. about those? Sure. So, well, I'm a, I mean, I think, I like the dreamers themselves uh, who have uh, embraced a broader or more comprehensive reform package because they want reform to help their parents, who they call the original dreamers. Mm. Really remarkable. We have some of the dreamer leaders here today who have just done such a tremendous job of uh, changing the way America sees undocumented immigrants and this whole issue as a result. So look, I prefer broad reform. I thought the Senate bill, which legalizes most, not all, of the 11 million and has an achievable path to citizenship for most, not all, uh, that would take place over 13 years. I mean, this is not exactly a short mm. trip to citizenship. 13 years. And that's considered too generous by House Republicans. Um, so, uh, but we'll see. I, I think that, uh, I, I, I'm not gonna be an absolutist on this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the idea of legal status with no chance at citizenship, I just think is bad for our country. I know it would be good for undocumented immigrants compared to the daily threat of family separation. But the idea of institutionalizing a permanent subclass is something 
Well, let's just say we've tried in the past and it didn't work out so well. Um, and it's not something I think we want to repeat in the 21st uh, century. So, uh, or, yeah, are we in the 21st century? Yeah. Um, so, um, on the other hand, if there's, the, what the House Republicans who want reform or say they want reform are saying is no special pathway to citizenship. You know, legal status for the 11 million who haven't committed serious crimes. No special pathway. They can use the normal pathways to citizenship. Well, as Ed Rubin and others who are familiar with immigration policy, you know, there's, there's a way to craft that would help a tiny number or a lot of people, right? You waive the three and 10 year bar, you liberalize green cards for, you know, there, so the, the, question, the details matter a lot. So is there a way to work with the house architecture where the emphasis would be on legalization and citizenship option would might be harder for most? Would we be open to that? Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, again, we can't negotiate with newspaper articles. So, and the fact that they haven't brought it forward isn't because we're being hard line about it, it's because they're divided. Yeah. So if they bring it, I think, I think uh, you know, the, the, the details matter hugely. Uh, but I do think that if, if we could get a good enough bill this Congress, that would be better than, you know, taking our chances in the future, which might be three, four, five, six years down the road. So let's shift a little bit more to the states now. I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, the climate after September 11, uh, which, you know, has resulted in, in these very um, punitive measures against immigrants, including the restriction on driver's licenses and tuition equity, which also you mentioned. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what would happen, what, what is sort of your sense of what could happen at the state level if we don't get immigration reform this time around? Well, and then, sorry, yeah. let me just ask you a second related question to that, um, to the state level, which is, you talked also about the, the fear of the Tea Party, um, which if, I mean, if you could clarify what that means, that for what we hear in the paper is that Republicans are worried about being challenged by Republican House members are, be, are worried about being challenged by Tea Party candidates. So I guess I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how Congress members are playing out this issue at their state level and in their local jurisdictions. There was a big, in the August recess, there was a lot of activity in, uh, at the state level that seemed very positive, but I guess that wasn't in every state. So just a little bit more specifics on the, on the state level policy, if you could. Yeah, well I think the um, restrictionist forces uh, picked up the state and local mantle of, 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 of passing laws and ordinances well before many of us did. Um, and that's where you had uh, laws in local communities like Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and um, Riverside, California, a number of Riverside, New Jersey, a number of places that passed these harsh measures trying to make it hard for undocumented immigrants to survive. Then they went state level. Again, many states passed laws, Arizona and Alabama, and Alabama probably being the most notorious or noteworthy. Um, and efforts that had started well over a decade, decade ago regarding driver's licenses and in-state tuition, which were really seen as stepping stones to broad mm -hmm. federal reform, because everyone knew that there was quite a bit of, there was quite a limitation on what states could do. As the tide shifted, the Republicans lurched to the right and some of these state measures uh, were taking hold. Um, uh, again, I think our response was to uh, focus on voter mobilization, which succeeded in 08, 2010, and 2012, I think in shifting the overall climate, which has allowed for many states to pass more progressive pro-immigrant legislation. So I think we're now up to 15 states that have in-state tuition rates right. for undocumented students with New Jersey right on the cusp. Uh, I think um, uh, driver's licenses, which was all but lost, has made a comeback with California mm -hmm. being the most uh, noteworthy uh, uh, of changes. And then in reaction to the federal enforcement uh, overreach, in my view, something called the Secure Communities Program, which was designed to go after um, uh, felons goes after moms and dads who are driving without a license or with broken taillights and has led to 400,000 deportations a year. I mean, right now, the reason that Ju Hong, the, the, the young man who spoke up at the Obama presentation in San Francisco, is that most of those that the Obama administration is deporting today, 
and today 1,100 people will be deported, most of them would qualify under the legislation that President Obama supports. I, as someone who's an activist for 30 years of this, I can tell you that really pisses us off. That for no other reason than presidential timidity, we're deporting people who the president says should be citizens one day and ripping families apart. Beep, beep, beep. All right, so um, in any case, uh, uh, but so California passed something called the Trust Act and there's, it's under the heading of detainer reform. There's a number of initiatives in generally blue states to try to eliminate or restrict, not eliminate, restrict the police co collaboration with ICE agents. Police stop someone, they check them with ICE, ICE says hold them for a couple of days, in contravention to the Fourth Amendment, they hold them for a couple of days until ICE comes and picks them up for being here. So they were held because they were an immigration violator uh, uh, and are put on the deportation machinery where there's virtually no discretion to get off of it unless there's a huge public campaign to try to stop it. It's really, it's, it's, a, it's a deportation and detention mill that's out of control. And so I think states and local government, I think that'll be, in addition to, to driver's licenses and in-state tuition, the, the frontier uh, in the absence of federal reform, I think is gonna be on this whole issue of police, federal agent co co cooperation or not. And how are the, the members, uh, those who are maybe more particularly concerned about their election, yeah. how are they playing this out in their local jurisdictions? You know. I have to be honest, I don't hang out a lot with Republicans who are afraid of Tea Party challengers. So I, I talk to people who talk to them, um, and they say there's, a, there's some concern. Um, but, you know, watching at the Senate level was interesting. So you had real, so Lindsey Graham was one of the members of the Gang of Eight. He's being challenged. Uh, Lamar Alexander of Tennessee voted for the bill and is being challenged. Um, and most political pros predict that they're going to be fine. It's not so easy to knock out an incumbent. It's, it's easier for a Tea Party challenger um, to uh, win a, uh, an open seat with multi-candidates uh, than it is to, to knock off an incumbent. The two examples that exist, Luger of Indiana, Robert Bennett of Utah, um, they had other failings uh, as candidates, uh, but, but they were definitely knocked off in part because of their immigration stance. Um, and. Uh, you know, so, so there, is, there, there is a reality to it. But, um, you know, I always point to the, in Alabama, this guy Spencer Bacchus, who uh, mm -hmm. in one of the reddest districts in Alabama, after the Alabama state legislature passed this law, the state legislator behind it, a guy named Scott Beeson, challenged Spencer Bacchus, who for his religious beliefs, thinks that immigration reform is an idea whose time has come. And Scott Beeson lost. So the, tea, the quintessential Tea Party challenger in the reddest district in the country lost to a pro-immigration reform conservative. And I just, I just think that, you know, there's some interesting studies about how, how sometimes lawmakers view their, their electorate as more conservative than they are. And I think that on immigration, the reality that we see in all kinds of public opinion research and in focus groups, that the perception of lawmakers hasn't caught up to the fact that the American people are much more interested in solving this problem, realizing that we're not gonna pick up and deport or drive out 11 million people. And as long as we do it in a way that makes sure that we have reasonable controls going forward or willing to support it. I don't think that that has quite sunk in to many of these members who have a kind of a diffuse fear of a challenge rather than a real fear. In the summer recess, all the reporters were predicting a huge outcry over immigration reform in the town hall meetings that happened across the summer re in Republican districts, and it didn't materialize at all. Didn't materialize at all. In fact, the pro-immigration forces won the summer recess. So mm -hmm. on the normal measures of political pressure and politics and, and constituencies with an upper hand, I think the pro-reform forces are winning hands down, but we're up against a uh, I think a House Republican caucus where that kind of rational calculation isn't always on, tops on the to-do list. This seems like a good place to open this up. I'm sure I've angered at least a few people. Yeah. 
Would you mind saying your name, please, when you ask a question? Yeah, and I have a mic. Actually, we're on mic too, Ben. Um, but would like everyone to please do say your name and if you have affiliation with Rutgers. Um, and then if we could, um, say if it's possible to call, especially on the students in the room. Sure. Um, that'd be great, because we do have a class with us today. I can't clearly tell who's a student, so. <laughs> I, that's you, that's a fair point. Both yeah. hands if you're a student, Fair point, helpful. fair point. Currently enrolled graduates and undergraduates, two hands. Um, but you did have a question? Any student questions? Um, you, you mentioned about the New Jersey Dream Act, um, and is that? Oh, so, sorry, hello. Uh, and you mentioned about the New Jersey Dream Act and the, I guess, the politics that are going on in New Jersey. I'm assuming that those are going on in other states across the nation as well. Is this going to be, do you, do you see this um, moving towards a federal solution or a state-by-state -state solution in the long run? That's a good question. I, I, I think ev everyone who wants reform wants a federal solution. An act of Congress is required uh, that will, will put people on a sure legal footing, that will do the other changes in our immigration systems. You have to do all of it. If you want the employment verification system to work, you've got to legalize the workforce. If you want to reduce illegal immigration, you've got to strengthen border security and employment verification, as well as create more visas so people can come legally. It all works together. So that's where a broad reform that includes the DREAM Act, an agricultural program for farm workers, a high-skilled program for high-skilled workers, maintain a commitment to family reunification of close relatives, all within limits, as well as stronger enforcement, particularly at the point of hire and in the workplace, and then legalization with dreamers being at the front of the line of those who uh, eventually get citizenship. That to me is by far the best solution. That's what the Senate passed. If it doesn't happen, uh, will piecemeal measures be considered by Congress? Probably. Uh, I, 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 I worry about, because there has to be a balance. Could the DREAM Act pass in Congress? Yeah, but what would Republicans insist get paired with it? If it's too much in, in enforcement, it won't happen. If it's some enforcement, maybe. So those are questions that have to be worked out. And in the absence of federal action, that's where you see the step, states step in. So uh, if the pundits are right and Congress won't be able to get their act together for a number of years, I think you'll see much more activity on the state level, both, if you will, pro-immigrant and not so pro, more anti-immigrant, depending on the state, um, uh, within limits that are being proscribed by the Supreme Court. And are there judicial avenues that are available to you guys at all? Yeah, um, but uh, I mean the big decision that the Supreme Court made in 2012 was whether states had the, the authority to pass their own immigration laws and it go beyond what the federal government allowed or uh, allowed specifically, and they said no. That the plenary power of Congress is where authority for setting immigration laws resides. It has to do with foreign policy issues, it has to do with all sorts of other issues, and we, we shouldn't have a patchwork of 50 states. What they didn't decide on is whether some of the specific policies that opponents like us say will lead to racial profiling and indefinite detention it didn't rule on those civil liberties concerns because they weren't at issue in the Supreme Court decision. So those will, after the Arizona law has been in place for a few years, will probably come back. And in fact, the Supreme Court seemed anxious to revisit those issues when they were ripe. Do you have another student question Sorry. on this side? Come back. And please do also introduce yourself. I'm sorry to ask this. Hi, uh, my name is Giancarlo. <clears throat> I'm an undergrad. Well, I had to drop out this semester. I'm undocumented. <laughs> yeah, Giancarlo. I know your name. It's good to meet you cool. in person. Likewise. Um, so recently, uh, Representative Heck has introduced his own version of the DREAM Act, which within the National Dreamer Network, like United We Dream and such, has sparked interest in possibly going forward with uh, an absence of what it looks like in our analysis, immigration reform not really passing, to possibly pushing forward and making our priority to be this DREAM Act and possibly administrative relief as well, instead of taking up the whole immigration reform mantle. Sure. 
Uh, what would your opinion be on that? Like, is that something that you think the national advocates would be down for, or is that something that they will still be focusing on on the immigration reform battle exclusively? Um, yes and yes. Uh, so th I think I think most advocates, not all, will keep the focus on the prospect of a comprehensive approach to legislation as long as that's viable. I suspect that if we don't see movement by March, April, that that won't be viable. Um, then the discussion will more fully turn to where others already are, which is what about pieces of legislation and what about Obama and the exercise of executive authority. Um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm interested in legalization however it comes, wherever it comes, from wherever it comes, right? So if we can't pass broad reform, but we could pass the DREAM Act, as long as the corresponding trade-off so, so, so opponents of reform, they want all the enforcement and DREAM Act. So they want to impose a mandatory employment verification on 8 million undocumented workers. A million DREAMers would be fine, but 8 million workers would be screwed. So that's an, un, that's an example of an unacceptable trade-off. Um, so so that's, where, that's where it gets a little tricky. Uh, but I think if it's a more balanced approach, for example, a border security bill that's now not outrageous with DREAM Act passing, um, that would be something I think people could probably live with. I'm probably negotiating a little too publicly, but since uh, we're, we're talking like we're in a strategy meeting, I'm going to be straight with you, right? And then I think, you know, and I think people re respect and expect United We Dream and Dreamer Networks to, to figure out how to approach. I, I actually thought the UWD, the United We Dream, approach to the HEC bill, because HEC is a, is a congressman in a purple district in Nevada, a changing state that has gone from red to, is on its way to blue, primarily because of the Hispanic vote. And so Joe Heck is in one of those districts where he either gets immigration reform passed or looks like he tried really hard or he'll, he'll probably lose his seat. So the problem I have with the HEC bill is not the content, from what I can tell, it's pretty good is that he's doing it for self-protection, not to organize other Democrats so far. If he does it to organize other, I'm uh, sorry, other Republicans. If he does it to get support and put pressure on leadership, then I think that's interesting. But if he's doing it to cover his um, posterior, you know, that's interesting and it's important, but it's not something we can ride to a legislative victory. Anyway, all options open. And, you know, we're, we're not gonna, easily say no to anything just because it doesn't fit, you know, what our ideal situation is. We're interested in results. And that was off the record. Um, hello, my name is Brian. I'm a student here at Yelton and Rutgers. I had a question about the uh, seasonal workers. I feel like um, we don't have as many programs as before. My grandfather actually worked for the Bracer program over in California. And I was just wondering why haven't we seen, um, why hasn't Congress used those kind of programs to help immigrants or help um, to a sense stop this huge wave of immigration or try to at least get yeah. yeah. I get it. I mean, you know, one of the ways that you reduce illegal immigration significantly is to open up channels for legal immigration in a way that is labor market sensitive. So while it became discredited, the Bracero program that was in place in the 40s, 50s, and into the early 60s, during that period, illegal immigration was almost unknown because you could sign up with a contract and come work in the United States on a seasonal basis and go back for the most part, these were uh, workers from Mexico. Because of real instances of exploitation and uh, uh, salary, you know, wage theft, et cetera, uh, the Bracero program fell into disrepute and was ended. Um, what happened then was the workers kept coming, but illegally. It was essentially the same labor migration that was now deemed illegal what had once been deemed legal. Now, what happened in the 80s and 90s is that what was primarily a seasonal migration of farm workers became a more permanent migration of service workers and hospitality workers 
construction workers and so forth. So the nature of the flow changed. And then with a the crackdown at the border that started in the mid 90s, the cost of going back and forth was harder. So people settled. Sojourners became settlers and had families. And once you have a kid here, the academics say that pretty much signals you're going to stay. So um, what, what, the, what the Senate bill does, for example, is it expands and reforms the agricultural worker program does, and seasonal worker program. It doesn't so much expand it as it reforms it in a way where farm worker advocates and growers came together to negotiate it. It's not perfect, but the idea is that we need an expanded flow of workers to come with protection of rights because whatever the seasonal workers get paid sets the wage for the entire industry. So it's not like these, just these workers get affected, 1.5 or 2 million uh, agricultural workers get affected. Um, so it's a very complex area of law because you have to balance workers' rights, American workers' opportunities with employer demand, and it's really tricky. We haven't quite gotten it right. But um, the idea of doing that separately is another piece that might come into play in a piecemeal package because it's so popular on both sides of the aisle. But the real conflict between the two parties is the farm worker advocates tend to get backing from Democrats who say, don't screw these workers and undercut Americans. And the uh, uh, Republicans tend to be help the growers and make sure that the regulatory burden is lighter on them so that they can stay competitive in a global marketplace. I think somewhere in the middle there, the Senate bill, I thought, got it basically right. And I'm hoping but, uh, that, that it would be part of that reform. Um, but it's only part of the solution now because, as I say, the nature of work of labor migrants has changed so much. Uh, you're more likely to see uh, uh, Mexican and Central American workers in the cities, in the restaurants, in the hotels, uh, in the construction sites than you are uh, in the fields. Do we, what time is the class? There's a class um, here. We've got about 2.30. We should wrap up by, okay. by about 2.30. Oh, um, so we've got a little bit of time. Oh, my God. Any other yeah. student questions? Hi, I'm Derek. I'm a poli-sci student. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, reactionary positions within labor politics that affect how this goes forward. Yeah. Um, it's, well, the labor movement used to be much more divided than it is now. There are still divisions, but it's not nearly as divided. It used to be that the American labor movement um, was mostly hostile to immigrant workers, seeing them as a threat to jobs and uh, working conditions. That has changed. It started in the unions that were organizing immigrant workers, like the United Farm Workers, like the hotel and hospitality workers, like Unite Here Now, um, uh, or SEIU, Service Employees International Union, which was organizing janitors. And they were sort of the, I remember back in <laughs> 2000, when they got the AFL to sort of revise their policy on it, they were sort of like these, they seemed like sort of rabble-rousing outsiders in the labor movement that had kind of a, let's just say a crusty white demeanor. Let's just put it that way. Um, there's still tensions within the labor movement, but I think the labor movement is, in fact, in 2007, I was on the opposite side of the AFL-CIO for the immigration bill that was pending because the temporary worker program was so weighted in the favor of employers, they thought it would uh, screw American workers in a number of key sectors. Um, I wouldn't call that reactionary so much. Uh, they were reacting to a bad bill. I thought they made a tactical mistake. But we're buds now because they've really closed ranks. They've figured out how to get, get to reform. And I've become sensitized to their issues. I think you know, one of the things that many of us immigration policy types were like, we, we saw uh, unfilled jobs and immediately thought, aha, immigrants can come legally. Well, for many labor advocates and American worker advocates, they see job shortages as a way to pressure, to create up, mm. a, a uptick in, in wage pressure. And I think they're, they're right about that. So I think many of us have become less sort of, you know, oh gee, immigration good and labor concerns bad to 
no, those concerns are legitimate. We've got to craft a policy which tries to balance those. Again, I think we're in a real, we're in a rough draft of what will be the 21st century. You know, we're like, you know, back when the progressive era was trying to figure out child labor laws and minimum wages and, you know, conditions and meatpacking plants. We're at that stage in the 21st century on regulating immigration. And so, but the labor voice has become increasingly influential. I know I've been influenced by it, and I think they um, really have done an excellent job of making sure that you balance how do you bring in immigrants in a way that, that helps immigrant workers succeed, doesn't disadvantage American workers or undercut them, and is responsive enough to employer demand where you can have a growing economy, but not at the expense of immigrant or American workers. So I think they've come a long way in a short time. They, they brought on a, a former Labor Secretary, Ray Marshall, to work on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, a program that really helped unite, particularly the building trades, I think, are the most suspicious unions. Um, but nevertheless, uh, they're really united, and uh, Trump and the AFL and their member uh, uh, unions have really been very strong in reform. I think it's one of the most dramatic and perhaps underreported developments in the debate. Well, that and it, you know the labor movement, the business, business players, the law enforcement, evangelicals. I mean, this is an issue that now at least seems to be uniting a lot of different constituents. I mean, how much of that do you think, how fragile is that coalition, do you think, in terms of when the negotiations actually start? We've talked a little bit about advocates, but when the negotiations start to play out, when there actually is something to negotiate, how well do you think that coalition will hold together? Yeah, I wouldn't even describe it as a coalition. We have a, you know, I'm part of the left coalition or progressive coalition. There's groups in the center, say Catholic Church, high tech industry, I put them in the center. And then there's groups on the right. I would put the Chamber of Commerce and uh, evangelicals who are in favor of reform in that category. Mm. Um, that's a little crude, but uh, you know, in law enforcement, I'd put more in the center. So we have left, center, and right forces that are for reform. You know, there are things we clash over uh, and that, that need to be negotiated. But again, in the Senate bill, you had Tom Donahue of the Chamber of Commerce and Rich Trumka of the AFL-CIO and a legions of experts working with them to work with the congressional staff to try to get that balance right between access to workers coming from overseas with protections in terms of low numbers, wage protections, and worker rights complaints mechanisms. Um, and it was the first time that the chamber and the AFL-CIO came to a deal. So I think it's kind of a remarkable, it was hard fought. You know, and there's big fights between high tech companies that have never met a regulation they like with unions who have never met a regulation they don't like. You know, they, they sometimes don't speak the same language. But it's, 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 a pretty, it's a pretty remarkable thing. So I don't think the coalition per se is strong. I think the forces are strong. I think the real question is with the emergence of, you know, the high tech companies being much more active this time, Catholic Church has always been a big supporter, the emergence of evangelicals as a voice for reform, the business community doing more in favor of reform than we've ever seen. I'm sort of surprised it hasn't had more of an effect, more of an, an impact on the House Republicans. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I, I, I've been critical. I, I was part of a business progressive coalition in 06, 07. That was our theory of winning. And I felt like we got our legs chopped out from under us by the business community many times. And um, I still am a bit bitter now that I'm talking about it, um, thinking about it. But uh, uh, I, I, I'm not critical of the business community's efforts this time around. I think they're doing a good job. What, what's remarkable to me and as a political science matter, is that the Republican, House Republicans don't seem to be responsive to it. Right. I mean, if, if, they, if this is the number one priority of Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley is viewed by both parties as the best thing that's happened to the American economy and a potential source of campaign funds, remember the currencies of American politics being money and votes, high tech, is not in the vote category, they're in the money category. And both parties hit them up heavy. I mean, it's shameless what both parties do. I don't blame the high-tech industry. They're under siege because it's new money and politicians are looking for it. But I mean, I just, I sort of wonder, like, if the House Republicans slow walk immigration reform to death, what do they say when the big shots from the Repu House Republicans come through and say, give us money so we can keep the House and protect you? But you just, 
Yeah. I, so I think well, that has to play out. I don't know. I think it's unknown. Let me, I have a, a question to sort of follow up on that point, and then we'll come back to you all, I promise. But how, how real is this fear that if there is a comprehensive bill that we're going to have 11 million new Democrats? I mean, is that a, that's something you read about in the paper? How real is that fear? Speaking from my own perspective as an immigrant and as a South Asian, I don't think it's such a slam dunk. You know, I don't think that right. 11 million people are going to suddenly vote only Democrat. Um, I think that, in fact, if the Republicans party was seen as more sympathetic to immigrants and to immigration reform, that you would have a, a perhaps even a more competitive party system um, in some parts of the country. But I'm just curious about, again, I know you're not hanging out, as you say, with House Republicans who are worried about a challenge, but Yeah, but we look really a lot at, at voter behavior and right. at polling and at you know, elections. I mean, I just, look, if George W. Bush can win 44% of the Latino vote and Chris Christie can win 51% yeah. of the Latino, when Republicans say, oh, we can't compete, that's baloney. Right. That's just not accurate. You can't compete if you tell people we don't like you. It's really hard to get people to vote for you if you say, we don't like your kind around here. So, you know, George W. Bush was awesome. I mean, compared to John Kerry in 2004, I mean, from the point of view of connection with Hispanic voters, George W. Bush was the ideal candidate, even with his pidgin Spanish. And John Kerry never smiled and would stand in front of Latino immigrant audiences and talk about the need for affirmative action. I'd be like, dude, you got the wrong talking points. That's not this audience. So it, it, not yeah. that Latinos are against affirmative action. It's just it was like, oh, they're minority. So we'll take out the minority talking right. points. Anyway, that's just a few years ago. And so um, I think this is very dynamic. We do a lot of work with a group called Latino Decisions that polls Latino voters extensively. Um, the, one of the principals, Matt Barreto of the University of Washington, says that basically there's about 30% of the Latino vote that's up for grabs. I mean, roughly 50% Democrats, 20% uh, Republican, 30% up for grabs. This is nationwide. Do you see what an accomplishment it is for Christie to get 51%? I mean, New Jersey's a little different, right? Older population, pockets of Cubans, I get it, but still, right? But even the Cuban vote is very dynamic generationally, so not to get stereotypical about it. In any case, the fact is, is that a Republican doesn't have to win the Latino vote, it has to get 40 to 45% yep. in a nationwide race, because then you can win Nevada, Colorado, maybe New Mexico. You can't win if you don't win Florida. But now Virginia's in play because of the Latino and Asian vote uh, as well. So, I mean, I just, I just, I understand the short-term politics of let's get through 2014 and worry about the future, but the Republican Party has a deeply tarnished brand now with the fastest growing group of new voters in the country. And if it blocks reform, it's gonna go from tarnished to damaged for a generation. And I can't believe that John Boehner and these other smart pros are saying, so what? It seems to be what they're saying. But that, that to me, so, so while I am an immigrant advocate and an immigration reform advocate, and I want the Republicans to pass reform, and I want them to share credit for it, and I want them to become more competitive as a result, and I think they will. They're not gonna take it from me. But yeah. when I, and all the studies show that by the time this group of undocumented immigrants become citizens, probably only like 40% based on percentages will become citizens. Right. And it's much more diverse than people think, again. But if Republicans share credit, I mean, there's a reason why African Americans voted Republican for 100 years. It's called Abraham Lincoln, right? And only in the 60s did that, you know, fully reverse course. These things are dynamic. Um, so. I just, I, I just, I don't understand why the House Republicans don't play by the normal rules of politics. But, you know, that we may look back in 20 years and say, wow, this was an extraordinary period in which they didn't. And maybe it's the last gasp mm -hmm. of a party in the death throes due to a changing country, or maybe it's a resistance that will be strong enough to you know, force the debate further to the right? I don't know, we'll have to see yeah. how that plays out. Or some real disconnect with the people on the ground, which you know, never really happens. With I just think for Washington. those of you interested in politics, 
you can study immigration from the point of view of political science, not from the point of view of immigration policy. And it's pretty fascinating. So we have a question here. And then Ruth, you have a question as well? I do, but I can defer if a student wants to ask one first. <laughs> oh. <laughs> OK, Ruth, you can get directorial privilege. <laughs> All right, well, this is, this is a kind of a Brian Lamb kind of a question. Um, so how did, and I think one, at least I would think, would be interesting to students who are looking at the future and not knowing which, what card's going to turn up next and which path and which twist and turn. So how did you get into this life work on immigration reform? What took you there? What's a, what's a nice white middle class guy like me doing? Yeah, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. And my second question really is that looking at elected officials, which is such an interest to us here at Eagleton, um, across the country, how many or what is there to say about the leadership uh, for reform among officials who themselves have an immigrant background, oh. who are naturalized? But ask, answer the first one first. Uh, you know, I always knew I wanted to work in politics. I just didn't like the idea of being a politician. So th that was as much as I had thought through when I graduated from college. <laughs> then I ended up, uh, I went to Princeton down the road, and they had a program called Princeton in Asia, and I went and taught school at an international high school in Asia, which was a great opportunity. And I uh, ended up working with Vietnamese boat people. I got hired on the spot because I was there. And here I was, kind of uncertain about America. And there, he's, here were people uh, risking their life to get to America. And it really um, started a journey for me of uh, what is it about America that is such a draw to people from around the world? And or what, what is it that pushes them out? What is it that pulls them here? And I've become increasingly interested in how do we as a society respond? Uh, our identity, our policies, our practices, our, our, our vocabulary, the whole thing fascinates me. So to me, the story of immigration is the story of America. And it's going to define our future in the same way it's defined our past. And I am obviously an advocate for a, a liberalized but regulated approach to immigration that, um, that refurbishes the American ideals that are beyond class, race, religion, ethnicity. And so um, I started this because I wanted to be a do-gooder. And I've ended up staying in it because I consider myself a patriot. Thank you. What was the second question? Oh, yeah. The well, leadership of the this question. from people who themselves have, in, in office, who themselves well, hey, have immigrant look, backgrounds. I mean, there's not that many immigrants at the higher reaches. Yeah. I mean, that's why SIU's project, the New American Leaders Project, is such a great, you know, encouraging immigrants to become uh, candidates and elected officials. And there are thousands um, throughout American politics. But uh, Bob Menendez, right. Cuban immigrant, refugee. Uh, and Marco Rubio as well, uh, the leaders in the Senate on reform in the House. Uh, interesting, there's, it's, it's Puerto Ricans that are kind of taking the lead. You got Luis Gutierrez, um, maybe Raul Labrador, Republican, maybe. Uh, he's backed off for now. Diaz Ballard, too. Uh, Mario Diaz Ballard, as others. So, uh, look, there's no question that those who have lived the immigrant experience are very sympathetic to what the motivations are. I mean, that's what's, that's what's so crazy. For politicians who say, you know, look, I'm, I'm for Latinos, I just don't like the Latino immigrants who came illegally, when most Latino immigrants, not all, most Latino immigrants understand exactly what people came from, why they came, and what they've gone through to be here, and are incredibly sympathetic to the undocumented experience, and powerfully. That's why it's such a mobilizing issue. The number one issue, according to, for Latino voters of all descriptions right now, is resolving the immigration. The number one issue for them. Now, does it affect citizens directly? Well, if you're a fifth generation Chicano from Texas, you probably don't have undocumented immigrants in your family, but you might, because somebody married somebody or somebody's involved with somebody. 
And so now something like two thirds of Latino voters know someone who's undocumented. And that's what that personal relationship is what's transforming the debate and making this such a potent issue. Again, I'm not sure enough Republicans quite get that. They seem to think that there is the Latino voters live in this neighborhood and the undocumented immigrants live in that neighborhood when in fact they're hanging out together. Also a lot of, uh, a large percentage of immigrants are, are women and, and there are a number of women elected. Um, Senator Hirono in the Senate. Yeah. Um, and Ileana ross Letson actually has been um, really good on this. Uh, yeah. So I think it's, I mean, to the extent that there are immigrants in Congress and uh, in the House and in the Senate, I think there have been many who have been you know, supportive. Uh, they've been allies, if not, um, if not, the, if not champions. I know we had a couple more hands up, so I, I'd like to just take a couple questions, and then maybe we can do some closing remarks. So, um, oh, yeah. this, yes. Hi, um, I'm a civilian here, um, and I I live locally. Uh, you had mentioned on on two parts of your talk about the currency, which is money, and which are votes. Um, and I, am, I would like to ask you, in light of the Supreme Court decision in the spring um, that has now opened the door to what we, many of us, call voter suppression, I'd like to know how you think that is going to affect the voting part of the currency and what is being done um, to allow easier access if the laws remain in place, which they seem to be in many states, so that people who are immigrants or would be looked at somewhat askance by people who put the laws into place to discourage the voting so that they can comply with the law and still be able to vote and have their strength not reduced. Yeah. But let's take a couple more questions and then... She's the expert on that one. Well, now I'll follow your direction. Okay, uh, there's a couple people right here and then one question here. That's probably all we have time for. Okay. Uh, my name is Jeff Perry. I'm a graduate alum, uh, and I want to raise a question about something you didn't speak about, uh, but I want to preface it with information that I think will be of particular interest to the students, and that is I'm a product of the 60s, and in the 1960s, uh, the civil rights struggle was a catalyst for the women's movement, the anti-war movement, the immigrant rights movement, all of these movements. Some very progressive legislation was passed based on movements movements which challenged white supremacy, right? Um, and now my question concerns legislation that pertains to immigration and refugee status, which is clearly white supremacist in its effect, yet immigration specialists refuse to discuss it. And that is, and it should have great bearing for those of us here from New Jersey. And I'm speaking about the Lautenberg Amendment on immigration, which passed in 1989 and has been upped every year since then and give special status to certain select groups who rather than having to go through an individual case-by-case -case basis for either immigration or refugee status get blanket treatment and can come in and become eligible for all these programs and the path to th citizenship that so many people want. Now my experience from the 60s and since the 60s is if you see such inequality you point to it and you use it to energize your, your forces. And if it's good for some, it should be good for all. Uh, so my question is, why is there never any open discussion of the Lautenberg Amendment? And I want to, for those who want more information, Black Agenda Report, Black Commentator, and Black Star News have run good pieces on it within the last two months. Thank you. Okay, um, yes, the woman next to you. Uh, ben Obrodsky, I'm a civilian. Thank um, you for waiting so long for your question. Thank you. Um, I understood you to say that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the construction industry or the uh, uh, unions are now more supportive of immigration reform. Could you talk a little bit about how that came about? And in general, the groups that feel threatened um, by um, immigration reform because they think it's going to affect their salary and working uh, wages and working conditions. Can you talk something about those groups and to the degree they've changed why? Thank you. Great. So um, you had a question right here at the front, and then I think we'll have to. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Bonilla. I am an undocumented youth here in New Jersey. I live in New Brunswick, a uh, member of uh, Win of the Spirit Immigration Resource Center. Uh, my question is, um, 
as an immigrant advocate, do you see in the future immigrants um, really being vocal about policy that has been passed in U.S. Um, throughout its history that uh, directly affects people in developing countries like free trade agreements that really is would be addressing like the root cause of immigration and why people are so attracted to come here to the U.S. Um, and I think that that's my question. Yeah, thank Great. you. All right. <laughs> Why don't I give you a minute? White supremacy, the Lautenberg Amendment. What was your question again, sir? About the unions, um, unions and the shift and, in unions. And an effect on workers and root causes and U.S. responsibilities. That's and easy. I'll, I'll do 30 seconds on voter. And voter, sir. Yeah. Why don't you start while I collect my thoughts? Okay. Well. Um, so, you know, I have to say that one of the things that I have found um, the most inspiring in doing my work um, on, on organizing immigrants is the effect that the anti-immigrant legislation in Arizona had on civic engagement in Arizona. So I would say two things about these um, measures. One is that for many of us, I will say, not just many immigrants, for many of us who come to this country, we come because we want to have the kind of freedoms that America allows. And so I think when you push back against those, that it does um, instigate activity in a way that you might not expect. So for example, you might take it for granted that you can go and cast your vote, but when that is threatened, that there is there are organizations and individuals who mobilize to to push back against those restrictions. Um, I also will say that there, there, this is sort of goes to Ruth's question about election officials. There are a number of elected officials who are serving immigrant communities, serving communities around the United States who are concerned about the ways that voter restriction laws are affecting their constituents. And so there has been a lot of organizing around you know, new ways of ensuring that we can increase voter participation. So whether that's same day voter registration or other mechanisms that enable more immigrants to come to the polls. Uh, I think there's a lot of efforts that are start of, that had started a couple of years ago that I think will strengthen over time. Because I do think that there are large numbers of Americans uh, who are affected by these laws who don't take the vote for granted. I think people, take, people who do take the vote for granted tend to be people who have always had it, um, which is not the case for many immigrants and Americans of color. And so I, I do think you're going to see the same kind of bottom-up organizing um, continuing and growing if, uh, if there is an impact on, on, um, on voters in the way that we predict uh, the Supreme Court decisions will have. And then there's also, you know, congressional paths that I, that I think people are looking at um, as ways to kind of push back. Is that enough time? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I actually, the, f for reasons that I don't quite understand, the refugee world and the immigration world does stay sort of separate. So, I haven't worked on refugee policy issues for many well, years. The UN says, the UN High Commission says no one Virtually no one who came in under the Lautenberg Amendment, which is a refugee status, would qualify by international standards. Yeah. And so we're clear. It's a little bit of I understand. So I, as I understand, it's, it's kind of like a special carve out for certain groups of refugees of um, that were, from the point of view of advocates for it, were being treated poorly by the bureaucracy. Uh, but it does give sort of special class protection for a group of people who want to come to the United States, Soviet Jews, I think Vietnamese, and some uh, evangelicals from, I don't know, somewhere. Former Soviet Union. <laughs> Former Soviet Union, thank you. Um, and there's also special protections in the law for Cubans, their so-called wet foot, dry foot policy. Um, so immigration is not the only area where there's, uh, where more powerful groups have carved out special exceptions for themselves. Um, uh, but, but your other question, I, I know you're interested in the Lautenberg Amendment, I'm, it's not what I work on, but to the, the question of white supremacy in this debate, um, I think that that's been an issue that has become more focused on in recent years because, in fact, some of the most ardent opponents of immigration reform have some pretty disturbing ties to the white supremacy movement. And so that has been exposed through research from, by groups like the Center for New Community, Southern Poverty uh, Law Center, uh, and, and it's been highlighted in a way uh, 
that I think has uh, made those groups less effective. They used to present themselves as kind of pro-labor, pro-African-American, but it's harder to do that when uh, your funding seems to come from sources that are interested in keeping people of color out of the country. Um, so that's uh, it's a more controversial area. It's one we engage in, though we run to the gunfire on it and aren't afraid of it. And um, you know, it's, it's not for everybody, but it, it's certainly for us um, because we think it's an important part of the debate. Uh, with respect to workers' rights and the unions, you know, um, I think the labor unions change on immigration and worker advocates generally has been, it's that immigrants started to show up in bigger and bigger numbers starting in the late 60s, accelerated in the 70s, and the initial reaction like for many sectors of society was, where did these people come from? And what's the impact on fill in the blank? And um, particularly in the area of say construction or when there's work crews, the idea of a work crew assembled by, of undocumented workers who were being paid off the books and under wage to cut off a work crew that was made up of Americans who didn't have that, that, that was a real sore spot. Um, and it still exists, but um, over time, I think what the unions have realized is that those workers aren't a threat to unions, they're the future of unions, they're the future of the progressive movement if they're incorporated. Not all immigrants, there's a whole lot of conservative immigrants that go to church, want to start businesses, and support militarism. So for all you progressives, sorry. There's, that's, that's just the truth about that. There's a huge swath and still up for grabs. However, the majority are very much in favor of uh, minimum wage, worker protections, social mobility programs, strong investments in education, and protections for workers, because that's where most are. And so it's been this sort of from immigrants versus workers to immigrant workers are us notion. It hasn't been pretty, but it's happened over time. Uh, and, and, and there's still tensions around it. But um, I think in many respects, the American labor movement is going back to its roots. It it's, was founded by immigrant mm -hmm. workers. And, uh, and I think that they've rediscovered that that's, that's the future. And so they don't see immigrants here, workers here, they see it as part and parcel of the the, the movement going forward. And I think that's true for most worker advocates. The think tank that does the most interesting work on this from a labor perspective is called the uh, Economic Policy Institute, EPI. And um, they, they're, they're very skeptical about immigration, um, but have, through their research, come to the conclusion that, in fact, the arrival of immigrants increases the wages for American workers. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but because of complementarity rather than substitution, the dynamism that results, the better return on capital, it's not distributed equally, but in fact, American workers' wages have gone up as a result of the presence of immigrants, not down. Um, again, not equally distributed. Higher end folks have benefited the most. Uh, American high school dropouts have suffered some. Uh, they actually are losers. Uh, to immigrant workers, but 90% of American workers are roughly do better. So uh, it's an interesting development. Now, root causes, American responsibility. I, I, I spent 10 years working on Central American issues, so I, I know a little bit about what you're talking about, Anna. Um, the fact is, is that the US was heavily involved in intervening in Central America, and as a result, about 20% of Central America ended up in the United States. So I know uh, firsthand the relationship between uh, U.S. policies. Um, there are some, uh, maybe not as many as you might like, that are making the connection between uh, America trade policies, neoliberal trade policies, and the effect on immigration. I think this is the future of the debate. I think once we get past, mm -hmm. whether it's this year or two years or five years, there's gonna, the, the issue is going to not be so much who gets in, and that'll always be at issue. But the two big areas that should be the follow-on issues that people like you, I hope, will figure out is what can we do in terms of US policy and in terms of domestic policies in sending regions and countries that can make immigration a choice rather than a decision? Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I've talked to a lot of immigrants who said, you know, I made a decision to immigrate, but I didn't really have a choice. I had to. Can we make it a choice, not a decision? And so I think that's, that's a broad range of governance and, and investment and bottom-up development and macroeconomic policy 
and regional approaches to economic growth, et cetera, that we're barely scratching the surface. The other big area, and something that Sayu works a lot on, is the whole area, what are we doing enough as a society to make sure immigrants are integrating into American society properly? Obviously, legal status, as you know, better than others in this room, is a big obstacle to fully integrating. When you can't get a driver's license or go to college or, uh, or, or pay in-state tuition to college, and you know, it's, it's, it, your, your opportunities for success are, are restricted. So we have to solve that problem as a priority. But eventually, we have to reckon with the fact that about 15% you know, of the public is foreign born and that we mainly leave it to local schools and judicial systems and heroes to sort of figure it out on your own. And I think that in the same way that the, the um, you know, the movement at the turn of the century, uh, the settlement house movement and others, which turned, ended up being taken over by uh, the Americanization movement, which was more hostile, but there, there was a period in which uh, integration, as we now call it, was something that was considered a civic duty for a lot of community organizations. I think that's coming back. That's happening from the bottom up. It would be important if there were more investments and better uh, policies that would, were supportive of, of it at the local, state, and federal level. So this debate is still primitive, and we're dealing with the most immediate aspects of it, but there's a long way to go before migration policy, migration and development policy, migration and trade policy, migration and foreign policy, migration and social mobility, migration and workers' rights, all of those areas just need tremendous development and, you know, will be your, hopefully your generation that will really tackle those in a way that we're still dealing with the immediate um, and you know, struggling with it, as you know. Thank you, Frank. That was amazing. Smart and thoughtful and detailed and politically insightful. Um, and I think that this last question, thank you, Anna, for asking that question, because it allowed you to, to close on a note that situates this, this work um, as important as it is and as uh, outdated as our system is and as forward thinking as the, the bills hopefully will be, um, it's still somewhat primitive because it is not um, fully, it doesn't fully deal with the global realities that, um, that America is operating in. And it also, um, your closing thoughts also address this really key issue of what happens after immigration reform or without immigration reform, right? You're, you're not going to have people going, I always say this, that you're not going to go to local Duane Reed and pick up your green card. There's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done at the local level or continued at the local level to ensure that people are integrated. So I really appreciate the kind of historical, current, and forward-thinking insight that you provided and the fact that you had to talk for about an hour straight. So The, the pizza um, really worked, by the way. The pizza yeah. Um, thank you all for your attention and great questions.